Greetings from Grace OPC in Pennsville, New Jersey. Uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, it is an honor for me to uh, present to you God's Word in the first church that I was ever a member when I moved from Florida to New Jersey. And uh, it, it is an, an, an honor uh, for me and a privilege to be able to present God's Word to you this morning. I uh, never imagined I would be doing this when I first came into these doors. But uh, as, as, as the psalm says, um, as the proverb says, a man may plan his steps, but it's, it's the Lord that really is the one who guides his paths and actually sets it before him. Uh, if you will take your copy of God's word and turn to me, turn with me um, to the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, we'll be focusing on verses 27 through verse 32. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Acts. It's the third of the Gospels, the final of what's called the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, John gives a more personal account. But here we have Luke's account, and uh, just to uh, give you reference here about what Luke is, uh, Luke The Gospel of Luke is a letter from Luke, a physician, to a man named Theophilus, and the reason why he's writing this letter, I think it's pertinent for all of us to understand, is that he's writing this letter to give an orderly account so that Theophilus might have assurance of all the things that he he had heard concerning Jesus Christ. And so we can take that when we look at this letter And we can firmly understand that the Holy Spirit's purpose for preserving this very letter uh, to us, this gospel to us, is so that you can then have assurance of all the things that have happened. An orderly account of the, the acts of Jesus Christ himself, having begun here in the gospel according to Luke, which is Gospel of Luke Part 1, and then he's going to go on to the Gospel of Luke Part 2, which you know as the book of Acts. But here uh, we have the Gospel of Luke, part one, uh, in which we're going to look at chapter five, verses 27 through 32. Let us read with, let us read together. After this, he, that is Jesus, went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything. He rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Please pray with me. Father, as we approach your word, Lord, we ask you that you would, uh, through the power of your spirit, uh, borrow through ears, prepare bodies so that your people may listen and hear and understand, Lord God, your word, that we might see Christ in all his glory, that your church might be strengthened, that those who are idle may be admonished, those who are faint-hearted might be encouraged, and that in the end, all of that, that you might be glorified. We pray that you would strengthen your servant to speak your words and your words alone. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you be too Christian? Of course, that's a tongue-in-cheek statement, isn't it? Can you be too Christian? 
Well, the first thing I need you to understand, and we're going to peel through this as we look at the gospel, we're going to understand something about who Jesus is and what he came to do. That is absolutely pertinent. And so I need you to understand, when it comes to the gospel, the reason why Jesus needed to save you is because you were dead in your sin, incapable of saving yourself. And that Jesus Christ, when he saved you, he saved you into a life not of, let's say, um, overburdensome laws just for the sake of laws. But he saved you into a context of freedom. Freedom in living in thankfulness for all the things that he has provided you in this life, good things, that were meant for you to use as a means for his glory. Every physical thing that you might do, food, relationships, houses, health, all those things are meant to be a means to an end. The end for you to fulfill your purpose. And that purpose is expressed in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question and answer number one, hopefully is very familiar to you. You were created, put in this earth, you were created to glorify God, and don't forget, important, enjoy him. Enjoy him. But can you be too Christian? And what do I mean by that? Um, in the past, I'll say in the past few decades, there has been, somewhat within the church, a, a controversy over dealing with certain practices that the world uh, participates in, and should you participate in some of these practices. Let me give you an example. Halloween. Should you, is it okay for you to have your kids trick-or-treating? Okay. Um, many people in the world look at it and use it for a reason for all types of debauchery and evil and sorcery and witchcraft and and the worshiping of, of, of demons and, 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 de and the dead. But is that what all people do? It's always good that when you ask that question, you bring it down to the very simple, okay? The simple question is this. Is it wrong, for instance, for uh, you to dress up your kids in, uh, in a Super Mario character? Um, and cute little outfits, um, some, I, my kids is like, like to dress up in these blow-up dinosaur when they walk around in a blow-up dinosaur. Is it, is it right for them to, to dress up in those little, funny little characters, go around and uh, ask for candy in different neighborhoods? Candy from houses that parents know and they're safe. Um, I remember one time uh, listening to a, a comedy bit by Jerry Seinfeld. And Jerry Seinfeld is talking about this idea where kids love candy. And they love candy, and they're talking about all this candy, and they always want this candy, and the, and the parents are saying, no, you can't, no, you can't, no, you can't, no, you, you, you can't have this candy. Why, why, I love this candy, so you can't, you, sure. But then the parents tell the, tell, tell the kids about, but there's this one day where everybody's just giving away candy, and then you can get all the candy you want. And the kids are like, you gotta be kidding me. Can't, can't, anywhere? Yeah, oh yeah, anywhere. You, in fact, you go to any house in the neighborhood, and adults are literally coming out of their doors looking for kids to give candy to. And it's, what in the world is this? How in the world? There's a din. Which I, what, do, what do I have to do? What do I have to do to get this candy? This is, this is monumental. This is a great event. What do I have to do to get this candy? Okay, I'll wear that. <laughs> but it, it, it speaks to the, the just kind of the, it brings it down to the simple doesn't it? Is there anything wrong with eating candy? Is there anything wrong with dressing your kids up in uh, funny little characters and Disney characters and video game characters and things like that? Well, no. And, and where it becomes helpful is when you look at uh, the text in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 through 33. And there, Paul is talking about um, this idea of feasting with unbelievers and the idea of eating food that have been sacrificed to idols. Now, 
what the Corinthian church was doing there is that they were saying, you know, even if the food was sacrificed to idols, they could eat in any way, whatever. They were feasting with their neighbors. They were sacrificing to idols. But freedom means that they know the idols don't mean anything. They're fake, and they're, there's nothing wrong with eating food. There's nothing wrong with me eating food. There's nothing inherently wrong with the food itself. So I'll eat it even though it was sacrificed to idols. I know that they're good. And Paul says, no, 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 no. That's not what you do. And he corrects them, but he corrects them with a balance. And he says this in, that, in, in verse 23. He says, all things are lawful for me. Well, that gives you kind of a, a sense there in the, in the being too Christian part is are, 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 is, is, are we not being Christian enough by just associating with these, with these people and, and what, what they're doing? Perhaps think of, think, of, think of Halloween. All things are lawful for me, but, and there's a balance, not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. And you see there, Paul sets the framework here. And here's the purpose, and he, he states that, and he states the purpose all the way in verse 33 at the end of that section of 1 Corinthians. And that is evangelism. What are you presenting about Christ? What are you presenting about Jesus Christ? There is a particular type of freedom in the gospel. You need to define it in your behaviors. And does that mean, as, as Paul says earlier in 1 Corinthians, uh, that you never eat or associate with anybody that's an unbeliever? No, you just don't associate with their re evil religious practices. And Paul says in this section, is it because of your own conscience? Interestingly enough, Paul says, no, it's not because of your conscience. Because, as Paul would say, I'm not going to be tied down by anything. But Paul says, it's because of theirs. It's because you don't want to present the wrong message to an unbelieving world that it's okay to practice these false, evil, demonic religious practices. That kind of builds the idea of of where we are being, okay, is, is there a balance with being Christian or too Christian? Now, what I mean by too Christian is this idea of fundamentalism, which unfortunately within the culture of a, of a, of a, of a Christianized, of, of Christianized age, especially through the 80s and 90s, that in order to, um, to manipulate behavior, you say to act a certain way isn't Christian, and then you end up going beyond what the Bible really requires. And one of the things we have to insist upon here is that by the nature of the gospel, freedom means not bearing on the conscience of God's people anything that is not expressly written in Scripture. Period. The pastors, the elders, leaders of the church are not permitted to bear upon the conscience of you anything that Jesus Christ has not firmly said. We should be very careful for us to do this. And why? It's because of the nature of the gospel. And this is what this text is going to breed out. You're going to see what the nature of the gospel is, what Jesus came here to do. And you're going to see something kind of fighting back on him, especially the Pharisees of that time, talking, telling to Jesus, Jesus, why are you not being Christian enough? Uh, of course, I'm, again, I'm using that phrase tongue-in-cheek. Let's look at the text. Verse 27, after this, he, Jesus, went out and saw a tax collector, tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. Now, the phrase after this refers to what happens before in the text. Uh, Jesus uh, heals a paralytic there, and he tells the, uh, the, the leaders that are sitting there trying to say, you know, is he healing on the, on the Sabbath day, or, or um, what, why is this guy forgiving sins? Only God for, can forgive sins. Uh, Jesus says, you know, in order that you might know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins, he says, get up, take up your mat, and walk. But this speaks to the purpose for the reason why Jesus came. And it's expounded in this very book over at the end. When Jesus is talking to two men on the road to Emmaus and saying and describing this, that the Son of Man would come and that the message 
of salvation for the forgiveness of sins would be preached to the entire world, starting at Jerusalem and going to the Gentiles to the ends of the earth. Jesus came to preach forgiveness of sins. He came to deal with sin the first time he came. Now, as we come and hear this section, we start to see the practical result of that. This is what we see. We see a man named Levi. This is Matthew, uh, the author of the book of Matthew. This is not, it's not uncommon for a person to be named two names. For instance, Cephas, Peter, Simon. Um, Levi, a tax collector. He's sitting at a tax booth. Just to let you know, tax collectors at this point were well-known frauds. Well-known frauds. Just to give you an idea what the tax history of a tax collector is. The tax collectors worked for the enemy, for the Roman government. Okay, the Jews, their promise of a Messiah coming back was that Messiah was supposed to adopt his throne. He's going to sit on his throne in Jerusalem, get into war, battle the Romans, and kick them out of Jerusalem. And he was supposed to reign. Now, so the Romans were the enemies. Tax collectors worked for the Romans. And not only that, they were permitted by the Romans to collect more money than what was required for taxation. And whatever money they took on top of that, they could pocket. And many times, tax collectors took advantage of that. They were well-known extortioners. They took a lot of money from the people. And everybody knew it. They were legitimately sinful, sinful individuals. But this was Levi, a tax collector, okay? Now, it's obvious this man is a well-known sinner, probably rightfully so an outcast of the church. But this speaks of several truths about the grace of salvation which Jesus bestows. First, I need you to know, and Matthew Henry is, is a great, the great Puritan commentator, is very good, helpful in, in describing this. He says that, first, there is no sinner so lost that Christ is unable to save. Second, there is no heart so hardened that Christ is not able to convict it. Third, and extremely important today, there is no sin so terrible, except, of course, for the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, that any person cannot be fully cleansed and restored even to the point of ministry, what does Matthew become? He becomes an apostle. And so what does Jesus do here? He comes and he preaches to Levi. It's a two-word sermon. Wouldn't be all happy if sermons were two words. Follow me. That's the sermon. It's the words of Jesus. Follow me. This is the essence of repentance. Turn from your sins. Follow Christ. Trust in him. Don't trust in your things, in your possessions. Trust in Christ. This is what we call effectual calling. When the people are called to turn away from their sins and by their faith in Christ, follow him. The act of repentance itself does not save anyone. It's not the act of repentance that saves. It's faith in Christ that saves that. But repentance, you understand, is the evidence of that faith. It is the necessary evidence, as our, uh, as our confession would say, our necessary fruit of that faith, that you are actually united to Jesus Christ. You will inevitably live a life of repentance. Throwing away your sin and constantly, day to day, trusting and turning to Christ for salvation. Here, we have a short and concise statement of Levi's repentance. What does he do? Three very simple things. Is, the thing about repentance, this is what I love about the gospel, it's that it's so simple. It's so simple that even a child can know it. A child. What does he do? He leaves, he rises, he follows. Look at verse 28. Leaving everything... He rose and followed him. Now, the rising and following might, you, you can even say that to come together. The following is the living in the rising, you can say. 
these three words identify true salvation as dying to self and living to Christ. You die to yourself in that your, your life is no longer about what you desire and no longer about yourself or about what you possess. You rise and your life becomes all about who Christ is. Your life becomes all about him. It becomes about his desire. It becomes about his glory. It becomes about his praise. As Paul would say in the book of Romans, Jesus Christ, the life, the death he died, he died to sin. The life he lives, he lives to God. Therefore, you are to consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Like I always love to say, every sermon Every sermon really is about this subject. What is it to be in Christ? What does it mean for you to be in Christ? Union with Christ is absolutely critical. And the Christian life is all about learning what union with Christ actually means. You are united to Christ by faith through the power of his spirit. His spirit has dwells in you. His He is united to you through the power of that spirit, taking out your heart of stone, giving you a heart of flesh, and it's not so much just that Jesus is with you as much as he is in you. It's the reason why it was so much of a benefit for him to go to the Father. Because now that he is with the Father, he sends his spirit. And when the spirit of God dwells in you, it is the spirit of Christ. You are united to Christ, and what does that mean? That means you die to sin and live to God. Your life should be an ever-increasing and daily experience of what that is. Ever-living experience. What does that look like? I'll, 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 read through, I'll just read through a text here in Colossians chapter 3. You can turn there if you want. But I'll I'll read it here. If then you have been raised with Christ, there's your union with Christ. Seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds in things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. What does it mean for you? Put to death, therefore, what is earthly with you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self, the old, literally the old Adam, the first Adam, the one who fell. That old Adam has been taken away from you. You've put it off, which is being renewed. Now, you have put on the new self. Literally, the word is new Adam. New Adam, the second Adam, Jesus Christ. You have put on him, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, Christ and all in all. It doesn't matter who you are or where you came from. It doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter what ethnicity you are. It doesn't matter how much money you make. All Christ is all in all. And that's the putting off and now the putting on. Put on then as Christ's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against one another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. But above all, and above all, all these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace, the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Peace of Christ rule in your hearts. To which indeed you were called in one body, And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You need to notice the unity that's expressed and the fellowship that's expressed 
and the unity that you are to live out as being ones united to Christ as one body. Each one of you individually are members of the one body of Christ. New life in Christ involves evangelistic fellowship in which you are singing hymns and songs and spiritual songs, giving your heart and melody to the Lord, exhorting one another, and proclaiming to the world the gospel. And we see this in our text when you look back at verse 29. In verse 29, what do you see? You see Luke inviting a bunch of people over his house. He makes a feast in his house, and guess who's there? All his buddies. His colleagues. Uh, he's a tax collector, so guess what they happen to be? Tax collectors. And by the context, we can rightly presume probably that many of them were not saved. He's sitting there associating with unbelievers. Unbelievers. But notice that feast was specifically made for Jesus. He was the center of attention. He was the star of the show. And the reason why he invited them in is because he wanted them to meet Jesus. And here's where I turn and ask your question, what is the purpose of your fellowship? Now, it may happen in different ways and in, in different contexts. It may take time. It could be just a matter of just fellowshipping with people. But as one thing I remember, and some of you knew, knew my father, is one of the things he used to tell me all the time is, it doesn't matter whatever it doesn't matter wherever you are, in a believing context, in a church context, in an unbelieving context, but you go to an unbelieving context, and many times when we go to school, of course, there were lots of unbelievers at that school as well. My dad would tell me, you always have to look at every person as an object of evangelism. Now, does it mean that you have to bash their body? You immediately see them and automatically have to share Jesus Christ with them and tell them what the Bible says? No. What it means is, many times, you just have to show them Jesus Christ. And just as many people say, when it comes to Presbyterianism, it's better caught than taught, that's because the gospel, many times, is better caught than taught. The old mantra in business would be, nobody cares how much you know unless they know how much you care. How true is that of the gospel? God commands you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. But you were put here for, for a specific reason, folks. There is only one reason why God puts air in your lungs and the reason why your heart continues to beat. There's only one overarching reason why you are here. Now, you, all of you have your different roles and functions in that purpose. But the, the reason why you are here is to proclaim the excellencies of he who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's the reason why you are here, so don't waste your time. Make sure that you are fellowshipping with many people out there in the world because you don't know how much of an effect that, that Jesus Christ and his spirit might have in them, that spirit who dwells in you. So that is the purpose of the fellowship. That was the purpose of the fellowship of Luke. But then we have the idea of the danger of being overly Christian. An overly Christian culture, you see that in verse 30. Pharisees and their scribes grumble to the disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? They start to grumble. They murmur. That's yeah, a word that in the Greek suggests that they're holding a grudge. They don't like what's going on. And notice who they grumble to. They don't go directly to Jesus. They go to his disciples. It's probably an effort by them to isolate Jesus by trying to turn his disciples away from him. But their problem is this, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? In other words, you're not Christian enough to be around. Why be around them? Don't associate yourself with them. Oh, that's the dangerous, that's the danger of this idea of thinking that the world itself in order for you to, to be, I guess, faithful to Christ, that you can't only not participate in, in, in some of the debauchery, which is fair, 
but you can't even associate with them. You can't go to their house. You can't eat. Your, your, your kids can't fraternize with their kids. Can't do that. Not allowed. And, and folks, many, unfortunately, many people do think this way in which they kind of isolate themselves. This is a, a, a danger that comes around with uh, trying to cur- Christianize a, a culture or trying to overly Christianize their own culture. They become sort of a, a monastic type of, uh, type of environment in which in order for me to be holy, I need to remove myself from everything. Uh, the church has done that, done, done that before and it didn't work. No, you were sent here to proclaim the gospel to the world. And that means you need to, as Christ says, love your enemies. You need to pray for them, even those who persecute you. Jesus here gives a simple medical analogy. Here's the analogy. Those who, have, who are well have no need of phys- a physician, but those who are sick. You don't go, except for nowadays, you're going to the doctor because um, there might be something wrong. I have my views on that. Coming from a background of exercise physiology, I can attest to you some of those things. But most of the time, when you go to a doctor, you don't go to the doctor unless there's something wrong. Normally. You go to the doctor at least because you want to make sure there's nothing potentially wrong. But normally you go to the doctor if there's something wrong wrong to heal so that the doctor can provide healing doctors i say this many times and we come with the doctors doctors are special specialized in the idea of healing those who have something wrong with them um, and, and i kind of make this joke sometimes of me coming from the the health and fitness industry for for some years before going into ministry uh, when you when a healthy person goes to a doctor the doctor's like uh, 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 i don't know what to do And and it's true, they don't know what to do because they don't see healthy people all the time. They see normally people who are, have something something wrong, have a concern. But that's the way just the doctors work, right? Um, It's not the healthy that need the physician, but the sick. The sick needs a physician. And that's really the analogy that Jesus is saying right here. And then he interprets the analogy in verse 32. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And there you have the true nature of the gospel. I have not called the righteous, but sinners to repentance. If you use different opportunities and festivals and celebrations and things like this as an excuse to remove yourself from the world, even though the world might not be practicing something, that is in direct contravention to who Christ is, and you remove yourself from that, how in the world are you going to call sinners to repentance? To put it even more bluntly, if Jesus Christ called you a sinner to repentance, and made you righteous by his own blood, what gives you the right to withhold that same grace to others? Jesus did not come to call the righteous. He came to call sinners. The reason why you are sitting here is not because you're righteous because you are a sinner. The reason why you come here aching to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ is not because you were righteous, but because you had a deep-seated conviction that you are a sinner. And so of all people that you should all understand, that world, you should be running out there and saying, Jesus Christ came to not call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Or to put it even more bluntly, 
more bluntly. God himself went through an elaborate worldwide plan called history. And in that history, that history is wrapped up and centralized in the very goal that the Father had to send his Son, his only Son, so that he himself might suffer every malady of this age, might walk with every one of us in a fallen world, spill his blood on the cross, and endure an eternity's an, an eternity's worth of wrath because of what we did and then raise again in the third day. As some people like to say, the salvation of Jesus Christ is free, but it's not cheap. The Son went through all that to save you. To save you. What a lack of appreciation it would be for us not to spread that message to all of our neighbors, to all of our unbelieving neighbors, to proclaim that Jesus Christ does not call the righteous but sinners to repentance. We're going to sing in a moment, and can it be that I should gain? I would know what number that is. I always like to read what, what, that, uh, what the hymn is. What is it? 431. This hymn was written by Charles Wesley. <clears throat> Amazing thing, if you would say here, thinking about, and, and, and I always say to my congregation, when you sing, think about the words that you're singing. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain? For me who him to death pursued? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flame with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. You must get the text here of what, what Levi did, don't you? He rose, went forth, and followed Christ. And what is the result? Well, the result is the assurance of pardon that you just heard this morning. It's written, therefore, there, there in the fifth verse of the, of the hymn. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. And look at the unity of Christ. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. And here's the result. And this is the reason why. The reason why Jesus Christ died. The reason why he rose again from the dead the reason why he ascended to the Father, the reason why he sits at the Father's right hand and has sent his Spirit to you, is so that you can do this. Bold, I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ, my own. You have a right to access through the blood of Jesus Christ that even the Old Testament believers could not fully experience. You know that curtain with the Holy of Holies that they weren't able to go through? Only the priest once a year, and if he did, he had to have a rope attached to his ankle. Otherwise, if he went unworthily, he would die. The curtain was ripped the moment that Jesus Christ gave his life. Why? Why? Because every time you now gather in this building and you worship God in spirit and truth, you are entering into that most holy place. Every time you come into this building, you are worshiping not just with the people among you. You are worshiping with all the saints who have died in Christ, the spirits of the righteous made perfect, the, 
Those who have died before us are forerunners, the great theologians of the past. You are worshiping with myriads of festal angels. You are rising. You are gathering into, into Mount Zion itself, entering into that most holy place, into the presence of God, and you do it boldly. And why? Because Jesus came and did not call the righteous but sinners to repentance. I hope that every time you hear the gospel, it makes Sunday beautiful. Let's pray.